and uh, SMS as I look after the dynamic CRM practice uh, for SMS across it. And uh, I feel like that's my subject matter expertise area, but we're seeing a massive blend over the last five years of technology. So whether they are um, uh, particularly across the office suite and Microsoft's productivity suite, as you're seeing very much a blending of all these solutions now into um, tools that you can use to enhance and grow your organization. So really I'm gonna, as Jason said, split this into three parts. First of all, the concept of networks over traditional hierarchies and how your business runs. When I talk about networks, I'm not talking about IT networks or infrastructure, I'm talking about business networks and how your business runs from a network perspective as opposed to a hierarchical perspective, which is really uh, something that most organizations still run under, uh, a hierarchy model, which has come from the industrial revolution. Then I'll move into, if you like, this concept of a modern workplace to look like in the next five years by 2020. What are the changes that we're seeing now in the workplace and what's driving these changes? And particularly, it's millennials. Those born after 1980 through to about the mid um, 1990s. And by 2020, they will make up the majority of your workforce. And so therefore, that means your workforce now is either elderly, moving into retirement, and the new generation that's coming through that will um, be your key staff, if you like, in your organizations, they have a different operating model. They weren't brought up in the same operating models as we were. And how is your organization evolving to accommodate those people? And then we'll conclude at Microsoft's looking glass at the next five to 10 years of what the modern workplace may look like. And it's interesting, as you see various elements in this video that I'll conclude with, is that a lot of the functionality, which looks kind of sci-fi to some degree on screen, when I'm watching that video, I can map to various Microsoft roadmap products that are coming to market. Particularly one where she's working with a lot of documents, etc., as a new product Microsoft's bringing to market called Sway. But let's get into uh, what I'd like to cover first. So what's your response when you see this? The world has changed. If you're like me in my early 30s, <laughs> and it has a bit of cynicism, you might go, well, hasn't it always? Isn't it always evolving? Isn't it constantly changing? And really, who cares that it's changing? Well, in the last five to 10 years, you would have heard things like consumerization of IT. And that's been a massive change in how organizations run and they're what used to be very expensive from an IT perspective and only available for very large companies has now been made available for everyone. And Office 365 is a classic example of that. You know, something that in the past, if you wanted your full mail server environment, if you're a small business, 10, 15, 20, let's say even 50 staff, that would have potentially been an expensive piece of work for you. Now with Office 365, it's been the price has come right down and that enterprise technology is available for everybody. If I decide to start a business uh, tomorrow, I can have enterprise technology to run my startup business, which I could never have done five, 10 years ago. And that consumerization of IT has driven that. And then we have the concept of BYOD. And why has BYOD to a varying extent taken off and become popular is because often the IT in your organizations is outdated and staff want to use stuff they're used to using like iPads, like smartphones. That is part of their everyday life, but they come to work in um, most organizations and they've still got a big thick desktop computer with a 17 inch screen sitting on top. And I'm describing SMS to a degree as well in that description. Where at home, you know, a consumer PC now is often three, four times spec higher than what you'd get in your office at work. And staff waste a lot of time um, on those devices, on those small screens that affect their productivity. And that one then is the Internet of Things, which you would have heard more and more about more recently. By 2020, there will be 20 billion internet of things or devices connected that are not laptops or smartphones to the IT infrastructure. 20 billion. That's pretty phenomenal in what it's doing to drive data. So each of these technologies in their own right are having an impact on business, but if you combine these technologies together, they have an even greater impact. Right now we're working with companies that are wanting to take, particularly 
data sets from all over the place to help them make more informed decisions about how they move forward as a business. And we're talking about big companies that are now looking at Microsoft technology like Azure Machine Learning to analyze their 20 years of data around their customers and uncover patterns they never knew existed because they never had that full picture in the one place. So if we look at this concept of the world has changed, you should be going, so what? What does that mean to your organization? I would suggest to you it might mean the survival of the organization, whether it is around in the coming years. Here's a question for you. Fortune 500 companies in 1955, so 10, 50 years ago, how many of those 500, the best of the best in the world, these were the top companies in the world, how many are still in existence today? Exist, let alone be on uh, the Fortune 500 company list. 89% are gone. That leaves 61 companies of the top 500 companies in the world 50 years ago in existence. Do you know what their life expectancy was 50 years ago? In 1955, they had a 75-year life expectancy. 50 years on, only 61 of them are left. Now, if they're the best of the best, where do you fit in the best of the best when it comes to your organization? Where are you on that continuum? And when you consider that 89% of them are gone, how, what do you think the life expectancy of a current Fortune 500 business is? So the best of the best as of today, 15 years. It's a life expectancy currently. Now, I'm throwing out bunches of stats and stuff, and you're gonna go, yeah, where do you get all that? Um, feel free, we'll provide the decks afterwards, and in the notes in the decks, I've got all the reference data as to where this has been referenced. So, we've had, uh, this is the last time we're um, delivering this presentation around the country, and I have multiple companies wanna take this back to their workplace and really challenge their management, et cetera, and how they're operating, because they want that supporting data. So that's available for you. So I want to introduce this concept that the world is a giant network. And networks are not a new thing. The Central Commission for Navigation Rhine was established in 1815. And that was to bring together a range of countries in a networked community to facilitate the shipping of goods along the Rhine River in Europe. That was in 1815. It's still in existence today. If you go to France, you can go to their head office. And that organization with the membership countries are still in existence today. From this first network, if you like, or NOAA network, came the postal unions, followed by the telegraph unions, and then the telecommunication networks, and then ultimately the World Wide Web. So the concept of networks are not new. They have been around for some time. And so how does this affect productivity? I'm going to suggest that the more we network as organizations internally, not necessarily with external partners, but also external partners, the faster we will be able to innovate and keep up with the rate of change moving forward. Has anyone heard of Jack Walsh? All right, one or two. He was the CEO of GE, which happens to be one of the Fortune 500 companies that are still in existence. And he said, if the rate of change outside your organization is faster than the rate of change inside your organization, the end is nigh. So if that speed of change that your business is observing out in the market, if you're not adopting that and really looking, how does my business play in this new world? How do I evolve my organization? I suggest there might be challenges. So here you see two diagrams. On the left, you see a very hierarchical based organization, and you might be able to identify, some of you, that this really fits your operating model. On the right, you see a very responsive network. And notice the key things here, that information moves very slowly around a command and control network. In other words, the information comes from the top, and it flows down through the various management layers to ultimately what we call the edge of the organization. And the edge of the organization, if you like, are where the people that do the hard work often are working. And that information flow from the top down is the way most organizations currently run. Where if we look at a responsive network, information travels fast and it's adaptable and it gets to the edges of the network very quickly. 
Let me give you an example of probably one of the most hierarchical organizations in the world, and that is the US military. Would you agree it's very much a hierarchy-driven organization? Starting from the general at the very top of the organization flowing down through the ranks, they have an operating model of need to know. In other words, you only get information down at the edges of the network if you're in a, uh, a level of security clearance and you need to know something. The problem is, is that when you're on the edge of the network, how do you know what you need to know? So what does management say? Ask for the information you need. Well, I don't know what information you've got. So how do I know what to ask for? So in the Afghanistan war, General McChrystal, he was the general over the entire um, Afghanistan war from the US military perspective. And what he found was as a hierarchy-based organization, they were fighting a network. In a hierarchy-based organization, you think, well, if I can take out the leader, the organization could potentially become unstable and fall apart. In a network, that's not the case because you haven't got that centralized control. So what he did to change this is he declassified all information in regarding that war effort. And he went to what was called a need not to know rather than a need to know. So in other words, all the information flowed very much to the edges. Any file they had of any person of interest during that conflict, it was now in the hands of privates right on the edge of where the warfare was happening. And what happened? They uncovered tremendous amount of information that was able to feed back up the organization. This profile of a person of interest that we want to take out, we took him out three weeks ago, it doesn't exist anymore, so there's no point in trying to laze and how we're going to take this, but he was gone. And so this flow of information, and you've seen in the media, there's a private currently in a US prison who went and leaked, which is really a lot of the starting of where WikiLeaks came from. And one of the things you'll read, if you go and take a look at his TED talk, he was like, how did that amount of information get out to such a low ranking person? It was because of this operating model they needed to fight a war. And they're saying the world is changing. The traditional hierarchy models are no longer um, like they were in the past. And if you have a look at then how this applies to your workforce, where you have very fixed based workforce and silo teams, it can affect your ability to innovate, to uncover new ways of working across your organization. I've worked inside organizations in my role at SMS. For example, I'll give you an example of local councils. And in a single room environment, an open plan office, for information held by the team at this end of the room, if this, the team at this end wanted that information, they had to fill out multiple bits of paperwork to get it from that team inside their own organization. Was it a security issue? Absolutely not is because that's the way we do it. You need to make a request for that information and you can only have it once we've decided that we're deemed you can allow that information to you. What do you want to use it for? We'd like to control that. And so you've gone from this very silo because to a degree a lot of people think if they control information, it controls their job security. But the thing is it's potentially holding back the way businesses run in the new world that they're going to operate in. And then if you look on the right hand side there, the ability to leverage on demand, this global talent pool now becomes available to you. By 2020, 40% of the workforce will be contingent based staff. That's not full time FTE. And how the, the organizations will evolve is that you will be bringing in experts for projects of work. They might stay for three, six, nine months, but you will find the best of the best, not just in your local market, but potentially the experts from around the world that can contribute to the growth of your organization because they have some area of expertise that you'll use for a period of time, and then they will go back out to the workforce. So this is actually called the Hollywood model. In Hollywood, nobody owns all the actors, nobody owns all the producers, the directors, that type of thing. They have a project to shoot a movie, and what do they do? They bring in all the actors, producers, directors, post-production to carry out the movie and at the end of it, everybody goes their separate ways and available for other projects. And so this is really a, a view of really how the workforce is going to change um, as we move forward for the next five years. And as I said at the start, the reason that this change is happening is because of these people. Millennials, born after 1980 through to the um, early 1990s, they're graduating from university, so they're graduates entering their workforce or have been in their workforce for a couple of years now. Now let's just have a look at even the way these people are sitting. They're not sitting at a desk, they're not all formal, they are collaborating on a piece of content, 
concrete at this point. What you'll find about this generation is that they are very quick to throw out and share their ideas. So from going from organizations that are very closed, these people have only known sharing and social networks have driven a lot of that. And so people in the older generation, like Jason, he, we're all worried about what we share. Don't share too much, don't be an oversharer, don't put your personal life online. But this generation, they will have an idea and they will throw it out and crowdsource the iteration of that idea, getting input from others, and grow or iterate that idea very quickly. They're very collaborative by nature, it's all around sharing. They are very mobile. I have a nine-year-old boy and he's saying, Dad, where's my, when do I get my cell phone? When do I get my phone? He doesn't call it a cell phone, it's called a mobile phone, it's just a phone because it's got no concept of a corded phone that we grew up with. Now I was 20, 21, 22 when I got my first mobile phone. I'd say most of the people in the room would be a similar age. Now the difference is, is that those phones there were not very intelligent. You could make calls and maybe send a text message, definitely no cameras or anything, so you couldn't do any Snapchat. But if we have a look here about the mobile phones, is that they've only grown up with devices that allow the sharing and always on type nature. They expect their information to be with them everywhere. They will basically use an instant message type app like WhatsApp as an example over sending an email any time of the day. Right, the concept of email is, and I try to get my nine year old to email and stuff, and it's just, it's not a forum that he's into. But on Skype, he'll talk to me all through the day on Skype, on an IM rather than a voice-based scenario. So this generation, as you can see, is coming up, they collaborate early and often, they share information, and they've grown up in a very socially connected world. And then they get a job at your organization. How much does your organization facilitate this type of level of engagement that they've grown up through university, through their teen years, and then they come to your organization and they arrive at software that's 15, 20 years old that nobody really knows how to use. What, you can't use a mouse with it? It's keyboard only driven. And it doesn't, if I put information in there, it's not available everywhere automatically. And so it's a very foreign concept. And we're seeing, I mean, um, SMS has got a massive recruitment division called MT Resources where we recruit top level placements for other organizations. And more and more, we're seeing the candidate pool come through will ask, I'd like to have a look at the work environment for I join. I want to get a feel for what is the layout like? What's the, what technology are they using? What type of computers are we using in there? Because they have, you absolutely do not want to use the technology of yesteryear. So let's look at a modern workplace. Now this here is a photo of a Microsoft Office. This actually is in existence. Did you know that Microsoft had between eight and 900 staff in Australia? Pip Marlowe is the country manager of Microsoft and she doesn't have her own office. She does, she's the CEO of Australia as such and she doesn't have her own office. They have a total open plan office layout and there is less desks than the number of staff in the organization. So let's take a look um, at this office and really look at really how it applies uh, to the millennial generation. So what I'm going to do is just highlight some areas um, on the screen. So first of all, sitting at these bar leaners are a couple of people sharing a concept over a laptop computer. They didn't book that space. It was available. They took it. They needed to collaborate away from other distractions, and that was the place that worked for them at that point in time based on what their discussions were. Then we've got this chap down here sitting on a beanbag. Now that beanbag could be at home, it could be in a cafe, or it could be in your office, but if the type of work he needs to do means his earbuds need to be in and he needs to focus and not be distracted by anything else, that might be the most appropriate posture for him to be in, to be most effective or productive in what he's doing right now. I'm not saying that the traditional work desk is going away. Sometimes there is the need to sit down and focus in on something, perhaps have a few more screens available to us. You're going to see in the video shortly that shows 
the concept of shared workspaces across organizations that you can book for 10 minutes, an hour, off the street, scan in, use that space. And this is rapidly happening. Does everyone know LinkedIn? Okay, one of the founders of LinkedIn has started another startup called Liquid Places. You can look that up. And it's about the utilization of office space is around 60% of it goes unutilized. So an organization pays for about 60% of their physical environment and they don't utilize it 60% of the time. That's pretty phenomenal. And so Liquid Space is all about you being able to book the right place for the right type of engagement that you want to achieve. So this is particularly going well, for example, in New York at the moment, where if you wanted to impress some out-of-town business folks coming in, you can book, book very flash, fully catered boardroom facilities for that event for an hour and a half, and then that's it. You're out of there. You don't, you're not paying for it tomorrow or the next day. It's for that temporary period of time. And so this whole liquid space aside is about people listing their assets that are not used, physical assets, to share with other organizations with the right security and control, of course, in place. So I'm not saying that that desk space is going to go away. Now, let's have a look at this room here. So this room is a, a meeting room that could be booked, if you like. If you needed a private, like an HR session, one-on-one, -on -one, hey, there's rooms available for that. But it doesn't mean that someone has to occupy a, an office space permanently because they do some one-on-one -on -one staff engagements from time to time. You can book one of these available uh, through your exchange environment, if you like, a room for use. And then the final thing I just want to draw you to attention here is this little board here which is called the Surface Hub. So Microsoft is bringing the Surface Hub to market, and what this is, is a screen that allows collaborative interaction, not only with people in the room, but also up to 2,000 people can be called into a real-time meeting. It's operating what's called Skype for Business, which is a replacement for Microsoft's Link technology. The whiteboard component is using OneNote. So as everyone shares their idea, no matter who's connected, at the end of that, everyone can be sent a copy of the notes from the meeting. Nobody's missed anything. It's all real time, it's collaborative, it's stored in the cloud, it allows connectivity from anywhere. In fact, when we set up this presentation, Fody, Jason and myself, Jason based in WA, Fody based in Queensland, and me based in New South Wales, we ran our whole engagement and collaboration using Skype for Business. Sharing, should this slide go in? Let's change the wording there. We had originally set a meeting to start at 8.30. Fody decided to drop his dry cleaning off. And Jason and I are hanging there. So Fody just jumps on on his mobile device, still engages with us. And it's when he got to his desk, switched over to a full desktop experience seamlessly uh, for that call. As I close this section, I want you to look at, if you like, the concept of a modern person worker. And what this leads to is the infinite data that we're starting to produce. Did you know in 2006, we produced 300 million, uh, 300 million more content, or more data, than every book ever written in 2006? And that number doubles year on year. By 2020, we'll produce 44 petabytes of data. But that data is decaying at a massive rate. In other words, the information is only good at the point of time. It's usable, and then it's obsolete. When I first got into IT 20 years ago, we used to say, well, if you've got an IT qualification, it was for life. You're lucky if it's for one year nowadays. And you've got to keep learning, keep learning, keep learning, because this massive rate of change. But let's look at this person. First of all, she's got a sensor on the door locks there, indicating whether her house is locked or not. She can get a notification if she leaves the property and she's left the place unlocked. On her wrist, she's got a smart band there, tracking how many steps she's done today. How many have you got smart bands of some sort? A few. So, Mike tells me a lot of stuff all the time. I've got a Microsoft band, not particularly that it's a Microsoft band, you might have a Fitbit, for example, but it keeps me in touch with information at just the right time. 
So I'll give you an example using Cortana up here. I go up to Redmond pretty regularly uh, to work with the Microsoft product team on Dynamic CRM. And before leaving last time, my wife said to me, listen, when you, when you get up to Seattle, make sure you go to uh, a big mall called Bellevue Square, because at Bellevue Square, there's a Sephora shop, and I want you to get me a bunch of makeup. Right, how am I going to remember that? So all I did, I grabbed my phone and to Cortana I said, when I'm in Bellevue Square, remind me to get makeup from Sephora. That's all I said, I was in Sydney at the time. I was about a K and a half away in the taxi from the airport on the way to my hotel, K and a half away, and I'd said that about two months earlier, and the alarm went off and said, you're close to Bellevue Square, make sure you pick up the makeup. So no excuse, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so this is about just-in-time information. And then what you're gonna see in the next release of Exchange, for example, is that Microsoft has seen that we're inundated with email, meetings, that type of thing. We are often slaves to our own inboxes. And so they're gonna introduce new technology uh, called Clutter, which really deals with filtering out everything that it can understand from a programmatic level that's not important in your life. In other words, de-rank that, but rank at the top, the stuff that you need to action. And that will be based on the frequency of communication with key staff in your organization, content of what's written in that. In other words, you will be in a position to make informed decisions on the right emails at the right time, and the not so important stuff can be answered just at your leisure, not urgent if you like. <coughs> Notice this little needs water over here on the pot plant. At CES, which is a big technology show that runs in January each year, a startup had come out with a USB device that allows you to pop into your pot plants in your house. And popping the pot plants, it'll tell you when you need to water that plant. It'll message your phone and say, moisture content's low, you need to water that plant. Now, I haven't had plants in my home for some 10, 15 years. But, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, I used to have my swan plants and that growing around the house, and they inevitably all the ways ended up yellow. Well, not all my plants, but most of them. So as you can see, technology is starting to really move into every single part of our lives and creating this massive amount of data, and therefore the need for us to understand the data that we need only at this point in time to make the next right decision to move our organization forward or come up with that new innovative idea and allow us to collaborate with the tools and technologies available. I love Fodi, I'd like uh, you to come up. And what we're gonna do is run through, in fact, Fodi, I'll let you cover the scenario that we we're going to do this morning. Yeah, so Mark's talked about a great potential for the future for us to work in a nice open environment where we're connecting and sharing information quite freely. But I think the challenge is that a lot of organisations have wanted to move down that path for a while, but the tools have an all areas where if we did want to set up a video conferencing facility, something that really should be available quite openly for us, has been an expensive exercise, whether it be through networks or through federating security with external entities, our partners, our business partners. It has always been quite a complex scenario. And now we're finding that with these tools being available on the cloud, they're available for us to easily connect anywhere from wherever we're sitting within our organisation, right? That's great within our organisation, I think you know, it's necessary, but what about if we were able to give and make our business partners able to access that information and give it to them freely as well, the information that they needed to help us succeed? So you can imagine the scenario where you're working with a supplier who may have easy access to your inventory and also your growth in your different products and have it be able to give you their expert advice on how you could potentially market different products differently. Right? So I think um, the tools are now available for us to be able to extend our information within our business and also externally. So we're going to look at a bit of a scenario here and using Office 365. We're going to um, take on the roles of Spencer Lee, um, a sales manager, and Veronica, <laughs> our sales representative. And we're going to look how those two can interact with the tools that are available in Office 365 to make quick, real-time educated decisions, collaborate freely, and also um, conduct business with their customers. So the first thing, the scenario I'd like to paint out is Spencer is 
in a taxi on the way to work and as a sales manager he needs to review his figures for the quarter to make sure he's going to make budget, right? So all this, what we're going to see here is all running through my surface, however all the functionality you're seeing is also available on cross-platform devices, so everything from Android to iOS and also all Windows devices, um, and available on tablets and mobile phones. So what we're seeing here could be accessed anywhere. So Spencer's in a taxi and um, he needs to review his quarterly results. Well, he can go to his Power BI dashboard and look at his open opportunities for the quarter. Now this is internet connection speed dependent, so I'm just going to save ourselves about 10 seconds and actually flip to the report. Um, and we can see that he's got a $150 million target for this quarter. He's closed $143 million and he's projected to close $150. So all up, he's going to exceed his goal by a couple of percent. That's if he's able to close these opportunities in the next quarter. Right? So he's got six, I think it's six, yep, opportunities still open. So that sounds, that sounds reasonable, except for there's one opportunity right at the top there, the Northwind Traders opportunity, and it's flagged as red in our report. And the reason it's red is we can see that it's been open for over 300 days. So if, if that opportunity has been open for so long, there's a good chance he may not be able to close it in the quarter. So that raises a risk for Spencer. So being the good sales manager that he is, he thinks, all right, I'll have a chat to my sales representative, Veronica, about that, and see if she can expedite the sale. However, I should probably have a look at what other kind of sales opportunities we've got out there and bring them into the pipeline for this quarter to see if we can actually add some more opportunities to this and get my sales team to be a bit more aggressive on those. So he can use another feature um, of Microsoft Power BI, and I'll just jump back the screen. Oops, that did load up. My browser's decided to connection. I'll just open it fresh. Oh, here we go. So I have it open in a separate window, apologies for the technical glitch, but um, Power BI has a new feature called natural language question and answer. So in the past, when whenever we needed to build reports, we'd go to our IT departments or get external consultants in to build our reports for us. Um, however, with this feature, Spencer can now query his data to see what kind of opportunities are still open that he could potentially bring into the pipeline. So he can come into his... Um, here we go. He can come into his data query and write a simple query which will call against a pile of different data sources and bring into it the information he wants to see. So he wants to see, and my typing is terrible, so I'm just going to click through. He wants to see all source campaigns that he's closed in the past at, by the average days it took him to close them. And you can see here that his direct marketing campaigns are actually being the quickest one to close on average. So he thinks, all right, maybe I'll have a look at my direct marketing campaign, see which are open, if there's any opportunities open, and bring them into this quarter's forecast. So I'm going to take a bit of a shortcut. I've actually got it pinned here, but he could have written another query. But here we go, show he's got his favorites, his direct marketing campaigns that are open. And you can see there that there's a number of campaigns open um, in the direct marketing space, and he's going to have a meeting with the sales team to see if he can bring them into this, uh, bring them into this pipeline and make them a priority. So remember, he's still in a taxi, so he's doing all this querying and finding all this information. He hasn't reached the office yet, but he wants to get on top of this as soon as possible. So he can use Link, uh, or which is now being rebranded to Skype for Business, to call in his sales team into a, into a voice or video meeting. So he can pop down and see, look, Veronica is available. I'll open a quick chat session and say, ask her if she's got a second to have a chat. And Veronica can just reply when she gets a moment. And we know that she is available. So he can at this point, and I won't do it because we're standing next to each other, but he could just click on and initiate a link call directly from his mobile device or tablet, whichever device he's on. Um, he could actually 
start a video conference. As easy as that, so that's just showing a preview. By clicking on that, we'll do a conference. He could bring up one of those reports and share the screen with her in real time so they can have a voice conversation going and also be sharing that data so she can actually get an appreciation for what, what's changing. And he can actually call other people into the meeting. So um, after they've talked about their Northwind opportunity, he might want to talk about the direct marketing opportunities with the rest of the team. So he just drags them into the call. Right, it's as simple as that. Um, and if they were online, they would then get a phone call on their device and start a conversation. So now Veronica's been asked to follow up her Northwind opportunities. So Mark, I'll let you... Excellent, I'll just switch back to my screen now and... Uh, play the role of Veronica. Play, yeah, I'll play the role of Veronica. Sorry I'm missing the dress, but let's get underway. Um, so as we switch back over to my screen, you'll see it in a moment. It'll come up with my intranet, or Contoso, and part of this, let's hope it comes up, just make sure my screen is on duplicate mode. It does help. Let's see what I'm doing. Here we go. So as you can see, I'm on my intranet. Now, the intranet is currently hosted in the Australia um, Sydney data center with a failover to the Melbourne data center. So one of the important things about Microsoft's environment and how it affects us now in Australia is that if you are working in an organization that is dealing with personally identifiable information, PII data, it now sits inside their geography of Australia, and Microsoft will not back that up outside of Australia, um, uh, any of that data. The other thing that's important to note about these environments is that particularly in the dynamics area where you generally deal with a lot of personally identifiable information, is that that all can be encrypted at rest. So should someone get in, it's fully encrypted, um, and you can come to an arrangement with Microsoft around how the keys are held um, for that encryption. But you can see from the Office 365 environment, my dynamic CRM environment also operates. So Spencer has added into uh, my system and understand where Northwind Trade is, where the opportunity that was in play that's most likely going to close, that I need to get up to speed and understand what's going on. So I've landed inside CRM, I can see kind of my top opportunities, my top customers, I can see you know, which lead sources, I can see how my pipeline's going, and if you like my upcoming activities. But because I know he's talking about a specific opportunity, I'm gonna jump straight into opportunities. And there's the Northwind Trader opportunities asked me to work on. Now, as I look through this, I can see straight away where, and using this little uh, process bar, I can understand exactly where I'm up to. What was the last thing I did with this customer that brought me to this point? I can see that how I went through my qualification, developed, but I can see I'm sitting at this proposal state. As I to take a look at my notes, and I can see here that Alex has not been responding to any of my calls or emails for the last week. So the person I'm dealing with is not communicating with me anymore. And we just had a customer recently, and you know I'm not on the sales part of the organization like Jason, but you know, Jason's all panicking about why the customer's not turning his calls anymore, are they not interested, and what we find out is that the main decision maker, his wife had gone to hospital, was in intensive care for three weeks, that's why he didn't communicate. You know, so you don't always know the reason why uh, you know, that's come into play, but she sees no contact there, uh, who the stakeholders, and she decides that I really need to get another connection point inside this organization. So looking at the information, she scrolls down and she gets to this area called Insights inside Dynamics. And Insights is a tool, it's part of Dynamics to, provided by a relationship Microsoft has done with a company called Insight View. And what Insight View do is that they have 30,000 different data sources that they apply that, that scours things like public networks like LinkedIn and various others looking for information about the account that I'm interested in. So in this case, I can see Northwind Traders has been pulled in. I can see that down the bottom there, powered by Inside View. I can look at what's the recent stuff that's happened in the news around this organization. Now, when you get into the paid subscription, it'll start pulling in paid financial data, et cetera, around the organization. But I can see recent news sources, where they've come from. Over here on the right, I can see their recent tweets and any you know, activity that's happening on Facebook with them. 
But I decided to take a look at the people inside the organization that it's been able to discover. And as I look at the list of people, when it comes up, so this could come from a, a, a range of locations. I'll just refresh it again. There we go. I noticed that since my last time connecting, this person, Mark, I have never engaged with him before, and he's definitely not the CEO that was in play that when I started the opportunity. So I can see that he's connected on LinkedIn and Twitter, and there's a Facebook reference as well. There's a range of contact details. And then aside that I need to get in touch with Mark, so all I do is click on sync, and it's gonna bring in all that data and map it to my contact record um, for this person. So it's asking me, do I want to create a new lead or do I want to create a contact? Because I'm already working the opportunity, I'm going to create a contact. And it's going to say, well, here's all the data fields that I can find, and here's your matching fields in Dynamic CRM. Do you want me to create or update um, that record with that information? So as you can see, I'll just expand that out a bit. You can see all the fields that it's found as part of that acquisition. And it says, here's all the fields and dynamics. Do you want me to update those? And I say, yes, let's go ahead and create that contact. So it's grabbing that data out of the public domain and now mapping that into the dynamic CRM. I now have that information. I can close the window. And if I go back up on the record, I decide I'm going to update who my stakeholders are. So now I'm going to go in here. It was Mark H. Let's tab away from there. And it says, oh, I've got a few marks. So let's have a look. It was that one there. And I'm going to update uh, his details to be the uh, decision maker. And I decide straight away that I'm going to get in touch with him and call him. So now I've got his record on file. I can um, click through, understand in a bit more detail. You can see all the fields that it's mapped through um, at that point. Um, and as you can see, I have the phone number sitting there. So from here, I could click, give him a call, understand what his needs are in regards to this opportunity and what visibility he has. So as Veronica, I carry out that call and I get notified from him that what he wants to see is a product roadmap as part of, the, of what I'm selling to them. So in knowing that he wants to see a product roadmap, I will just um, go back and say, okay, what did I already have on file from a document's perspective? What did I got up to? And so I just clicking on this document section here, it's going to display a list of the documents that I was working on in relationship to this customer. Now, as you can see, here's a range of documents. Notice I'm still on the customer record inside CRM. Even though these documents, as you can see, are pulling from our SharePoint farm, where it's also been um, located. So as a, a staff member, I don't have to know where IT is storing everything. From a Microsoft integrated point of view, it just sits at the right place. So I can see the document or the PowerPoint I need to update. I jump back into, um, into my intranet and I'm gonna look up and see if we've got a roadmap slide available that I can use to merge in um, to this deck and send it off to the customer so his final you know, outstanding um, piece of information that he needed, um, I can provide to him. At that point, I'll hand back to Bodie. So Mark's gone through and addressed the issue with that aged account now with Northwind, um, and he's provided the information that the CO needs. Now, I also asked Mark to have a look at um, the direct marketing campaigns that were assigned to, sorry, to Veronica. <laughs> and she did have one, actually, with a company called Coho Winery. Um, and so Mark gave them a call, Veronica gave them a call, <laughs> and uh, then she said, look, we're really interested in doing this business with you sooner rather than later. Is there any incentive we can potentially offer you to buy now um, so they can close the deal in this quarter? And that's, they said, what have you got? And um, Veronica had a bit of a chat and offered them a, a percentage discount to buy now um, and uh, rather than buying next quarter. And they accepted that. So what she did was she um, created a quote then and then uploaded it into SharePoint as part of, uh, against that account. So now if I go into, as a sales manager, I can go into CRM and have a look at the account and see the quote sitting there. Now, the next step is actually getting that quote off to the customer and having the customer approve it and send it back to us so then we can uh, raise an order to provide this product. Traditionally, what we do at this point is that we email it to the customer maybe, they print it out, sign it, and send it back to us because we want to feel comfortable that there's been a, a, a legal binding record. 
Um, so they do that, they scan it back in, email it back to us, and then come back and sit on our file. Now, Microsoft has partnered with a third party company called DocuSign. So, what I'm going to do is open the, the doc customer's documents from within CRM, which will link me straight into SharePoint. And this company, DocuSign, offers true digital signatures over the web. And this functionality extends beyond your computer. As we said, everything works on any device. So the electronic signing works on your phone, regardless of the brand or operating system it's running. So sending for Spencer then to send off this document for signature is as easy as selecting it in SharePoint and clicking the Get Signatures button. So what we'll see now is that Office 365 will send a request off to DocuSign. Now, I'm getting a login notification because this is a demo environment, but this would happen seamlessly through your business. So if is going to share, basically send an email out to my phone that I'm going to digitally sign. But just so you can see, this is not smoke and mirrors. Does someone have a business card and we'll have a copy sent to you right now so you can sign it and it'll appear back up on screen. So we'll have a business card just with the email address on it. That's all we need. Excellent. Thank you. There you go. So first of all, it's sent to me, I'll demonstrate on my phone that I don't need any special software whatsoever. It'll come through as a standard email. It'll ask me, am I authorizing to electronically sign this? We're just currently implementing this for a major power company in Australia. Uh, they have a new division dealing in solar um, uh, panels and uh, installations across Australia, and they don't want to have any paper involved in this new startup part of their business. So from day one, all documents, all contracts have uh, been signed um, using DocuSign um, in this process. So we saw just behind this the document fully opened in DocuSign, so you can see a record of it and see exactly what we're signing. I can now send this off to Mark uh, and also to Gerard. So at ABN Group, it's ABN Group, free plug. <laughs> <laughs> Now, and this is going to email them, as Mark said, and ask for a signature. Now, you can also apply a little bit of workflow there, so we're going to send them both out at the same time, but you can actually drag and drop those around and send them in series so that it becomes almost like an escalation process. So if you require multiple signatures on a document, it fully supports that multi-signature scenario. Yeah. So I'll just, I can have the option. Now, in a, in a true scenario, we could actually have this templated, so all documents will go out with a certain number of fields attached to them. But we're going to just drag in a few fields here, so I think we'll just do signature and date signed. And I'm uh, going to now just send that straight through to them. So in a, in a minute, or less than a minute, Mark will actually receive uh, a notification asking him to sign that document. While that's coming through, I'm just going to log into Spencer's email, because another functionality we get out of this integration is that um, we get notifications when documents are sent, we get notifications when Spencer will get notified when Mark opens a document, when he signs it. So we get that full history and order trail through the process. So in this case, I've got the email, it's hit my phone, it's saying Spencer Lowe via DocuSign is asking me if I consent to electronically signing a document. I say I want to first review the document, so I'm opening the document up on my device. So as, as you've seen here, it's not required any special software for the user. It's saying, do I consent to electronically signing? I'm going to review the document. It's going to take a copy, and as you can see, it's pretty much identical, well, it's identical to what you saw on screen, except for there's a sign field. So I can start the sign process. I click on the actual sign field. It asks me to rotate my device, and now allows me to basically sign on screen. Now the signing is such, right? That is not really the signature. It's got to do with a whole bunch of encrypted certificates behind the scene that's validating who I am. But we live in a world where people still expect that a signature looks like a signature, so that gives the customer the peace of mind. I can accept and sign the document. It's processing at this point um, my signature. The date field that he put in automatically grabbed my today's date, so I didn't have to manually once again pull it in. And there you go, I've finished the process, and it should send back um, to Fody. Did you get yours? What type of flash phone is that? <laughs> is that an iPhone? It is. So as you can see, no problem um, working, doesn't matter what the smartphone device is. Now it would be similar if we went to a desktop um, experience. Okay. I won't go through the full process, but 
what we're seeing here is the emails are coming through, that the document's being signed, so Mark's viewed the document, Gerard's viewed the document. Mark, you also signed it, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, so any minute now we'd also get an email coming through. Now, if we let this go through the full process and we've completed the signatures, what would happen is also we'd get a PDF version of those documents with the signatures stored in SharePoint. So what that means is once they drop into SharePoint, we can then have our information rights management processes kick off or other workflows kick off, send those documents off to another mailbox potentially or another system for raising any purchase orders that we need or any requisitions. And we can also store those as digital records or archive them somewhere where they can't be deleted by anyone. So it gives you that full end-to-end -end process from opportunity through, through to sale and, 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 um, and ordering as well. Okay, so that wraps up uh, that demonstration. We'll just conclude now, um, as stated, um, um, with the video, and then I'll just close out with a bit of information about um, SMS and what we do. So the video that I just want to share, bring that up. I've talked about the shift from the old world to the new world. We're showing how technology is really ena enabling. The area I want to move into is, is look at the story of these two people, Kate and Lola. So Kate is an independent biologist. She works on multiple projects. She's based in Asia, and she's looking for work. Right? So she's totally independent. Lola, she's an executive with Ocean Biosystems, so a biotech company. She's looking for experts. And we're also going to see how this would interact in a school situation in educating students um, uh, in this world. Okay. <coughs> Not too far off. Okay, just in closing. Talk about uh, about SMS. So we're a, um, a partner with Microsoft, um, and we specialise in real four core areas with Microsoft. They are BI and Analytics, they are Azure, Office 365, and Dynamic CRM. And we go into organisations and really uh, apply um, what Microsoft is doing in the market to your organisations, and really um, take you on the journey of how you could transform your organisation. From a who we are, where we are sizing wise, as you can see, we're in all the major states across Australia, as well as Hong Kong, Vietnam, and Singapore. And um, you can see the, the type of industries that we specialize in um, uh, at this current point. A couple of other things about our relationship with Microsoft. Through 20 years of collaboration with Microsoft, as you can see, um, the range of resources, specialist staff, uh, et cetera, across this, the, the country. We're currently uh, Microsoft Public Sector Partner of the Year 2013, it hasn't been re-awarded since. And in 2014, with Dynamic CRM Partner of the Year, um, Microsoft's acknowledgement of our skill uh, in these areas. And actually, most of these awards have been run out of our WA part of the business with organizations like Main Roads and, uh, was it Mental Health over here? Uh, the work we did there. So what makes us difference, uh, what, what is the difference with the SMS? We, we're definitely not uh, an organization that comes in and tells you how to run your business. It's very collaborative. We go through a really design thinking process of understanding where you are now and where you would like to be and then address that with the tools that are available and how they map and can help transform your organization and move it forward. We're very focused on the outcomes that we're not just delivering projects for projects sake but really that we're moving the dial on, on how your organization can run, operate um, as we move into the next five years. And we keep things simple. So I'm just going to ask Sarah to hand out uh, a sheet of paper here, and it's got your name on it already. And it's purely asking you, would you like us to come to your organization and run through um, either a, an immersion experience across Microsoft technology stack to see how they would apply to your business, um, and or just discuss where you would like to move your organization forward um, in adopting technology. And with that, I want to thank you, Jason. I'll ask you to come up and just wrap up um, this session. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. So thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning. I hope you received some value out of that. As Mark noted, all of the content we've got here today will be made available afterwards. 
if there's specific pieces of that you want to drill down into, myself, Mark, Bodie, the rest of the SMS guys, we'll be here afterwards, so please feel free to reach out to us. We're receiving an email um, from us later today, just asking for feedback. Now, feedback's really important to us to help us understand are we giving you the content that you're hoping for and how we can improve and future to grow your business. So thank you. Once again, there's some catering that eventually did turn up, so if you are hungry, please get into that as Sarah will get into the caterers. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>